Perimeter is a fascinating puzzle of a game. Made by developer KD Lab and released in 2004, it arrived near the end of the golden age of real-time strategy. Many strategy games released in this time iterated on their established formulas, beginning to perfect what would become many of the real-time strategy game lineages that survive to this day. But this time also saw interesting experiments in the genre, Perimeter being one of them. Commercially, while the game saw enough success to warrant an expansion pack, and eventually a much maligned sequel, it has largely been forgotten. The game has a whopping 28 reviews on good old games, and 104 on Steam currently. Which, granted, the game was only available physically at release and it took a considerable amount of time before it made it to those platforms, but it still indicates a heightened level of obscurity, to say the least. Adding to the obscurity, the default manual of the Steam version is written in some kind of strange alien language. How's that for immersion? In all seriousness, though, it is an interesting element to the game's DNA, and I wonder just how much the game being made in Russia shaped it. Rightly, I don't know enough about Russian culture to say. So, why talk about Perimeter? Well, put simply, aside from being a fascinating experiment in shaking up the real-time strategy game genre, the story is, put simply, absolutely wild. From this time onward, you are granted use of a sacred technology. Combat robot transformations. Sometime in the future, spirits emerge on Earth. These spirits are humans biologically, but they possess advanced technological and esoteric knowledge. Using this knowledge, they built gateways which tunneled into another dimension. This other dimension is called the Psychosphere. It is made up of chains of tiny, flat worlds. These planes were called sponge worlds because they absorbed psychic emanations from Earth, being shaped by the ideas, hopes, dreams, and major events of humanity. The worlds themselves also absorb the negative emotions of those who travel there, producing what are known as the Scourge, monstrous creatures bent on destroying anyone who dares tread there. Exploring these worlds also created terrible reactions on Earth, such as incurable diseases and rabid wildlife. Even with this extreme danger, the Psychosphere worlds closest to Earth were quickly colonized. It was even theorized that the chain of worlds could be used to travel to habitable planets in real space, thousands of light years away. Eventually, relations broke down between the Earth and its colonies in the Psychosphere, and Earth severed all its connections to protect itself, leaving the colonists exiled. With the connections to Earth now severed, they decided to travel along the chain of worlds, seeking a new planet to call home. Again, guided by the spirits, the colonists constructed great floating cities which could travel through the corridors connecting the worlds. These cities are called frames. Beyond creating the frames and their supporting technologies, the spirits also took complete control over the people, having them undergo personality elimination. This was to decrease the occurrence of Scourge and other negative consequences of traveling the Psychosphere. The memories of Earth, their previous lives, and even their names were taken from them, as they became not but mere cells in the organism of the Exodus. Incidentally, most of this information is from the game's website. Unfortunately, little of the lore is fully explored in-game. Though, for some parts of the lore, that's probably a good thing. And so, for hundreds of years, the Exodus continued as the Ten Frames made their way through the Chain of Worlds. In year 244 of the Exodus, you, the player, take on the role of Legate, a role charged with defending the Frame and seeing through the Exodus project. Frame belongs to you, Legate. In the beginning of the game, you're only fighting the Scourge. However, soon thereafter, the ruling spirits in other frames are overthrown, and two other factions emerge. The Empire, whose Emperor desires to abandon the Exodus and rule over the Chain of Worlds, and the Harkback, who reject the Exodus and wish to return to the beginning of the Chain to discover the truth of Earth and their existence. You undertake missions for all three factions, from the perspectives of various Legates. So that's the lore in a nutshell. Basically, imagine Homeworld, with ten different motherships and three factions who all want very different things traveling along micro-worlds shaped by psychic emanations from Earth. Pretty interesting setup for a game, all said. So, how does it play? Well, much like the story, the gameplay itself is very unique. Each mission takes place on one of the worlds of the chain. 
Presumably, you are seeing each world in its entirety, as you can see the edges of the world fall off into nothingness. The only harvestable resource in the game is energy, which you collect by building energy cores which draw energy from the land itself. The more territory harvested by energy cores, the more energy income you have. Critically, this can only be done on perfectly level land. In order to level the land, you make use of Brigadier units, which have swarms of terraforming drones. In short, they are trying to build a flat earth. Alongside Brigadiers, there are Buildmasters, which send energy from your storage to building projects. You can have a mix of five Brigadiers or Buildmasters total, and you can easily convert one to the other in your frame. Figuring out the correct balance can be important to your rate of expansion and energy economy. Energy cores can also put out the titular Perimeter Defense Field, which blocks all scourge and incoming fire, but costs a tremendous amount of energy to sustain. You can activate individual cores or turn the entire field on and off as needed even. This drains a lot of your energy though. However, the AI never seems to run out of energy, so you can expect them to spam their perimeter whenever possible. Needless to say, this is somewhat irritating and can make it difficult to progress at times, as you have to utilize specialized units that ignore the barrier, while still defending your own territory. On that note, you can build a variety of static defense buildings on powered land to defend your base. Some missions can even be played as if it were a tower defense game. Each attack from a static defense structure or a unit costs energy too, making energy production even more critical to success. Anyway, let's move on to the units. Units are another area where Perimeter experiments heavily. There are three basic units, soldiers, officers, and technicians. Each of these units has their own kind of factory. With the right laboratory buildings, a squad of these basic units can transmute themselves into any number of different advanced units, based on how many of the basic units the squad has. Now, this transformation is not permanent, and you can transmute your units on the fly anytime you want after a cooldown period. This leads to highly dynamic matchups where not only what you're fighting, but what you're fighting with can be changed to a new unit type to better adapt to the situation. You can, say, transmute your units into air units, fly them across a void, and then transmute them back into ground units on the other side. Now, when using these units, a large part of the game revolves around destroying your opponent's terraformed land, which will cause buildings on that land to take damage. Certain kinds of land damage can be done through the perimeter field, making it critical to cracking enemy defenses. So all that taken together makes up the experimental gameplay of Perimeter. Was the experiment a success? Well, I like to think so, to a point. It is satisfying to watch the landscape be gradually terraformed and to fight with these strange transmuting units. It holds up surprisingly well, in fact, even relative to contemporary real-time strategy games. I couldn't tell you if the multiplayer was any good, admittedly, as I never played it at release and it's been long dead now. That said, the campaign is definitely the meat of the experience here, so let's get into it. You know those missions in real-time strategy games where you start off with little to nothing, putting you up against an enemy base that spans most of the map? Crank that up to 11 and that's basically every other mission in Perimeter. Given that base size directly correlates to the size of your economy, and therefore, your offensive capability, this presents quite the challenge to overcome. Particularly as, again, every single attack your units and structures makes drains your energy. The game's difficulty curve is really more like a sine wave, by which I mean there are a few unexpected difficulty spikes. Looking at you, bio damage and Kurg. But there are also some missions which are significantly easier than those that came before. It legitimately feels like the campaign missions are out of order. For a concrete example, there's an instance where a new structure, the Howitzer, is announced and highlighted in a mission that comes after a mission where they've already been unlocked. Anyway, so the campaign itself? Well, it's pretty good, but honestly, pretty frustrating at times too. Strange difficulty curve aside, overall, I won't mince words, it's a hard game. Often, the AI starts with not only full bases, but large squads of units, too. And the objectives often require you to move very quickly, so your execution has to be precise. In my eye, there's no shame in lowering the difficulty setting now and again, although I have no idea what that actually changes. And while the campaign AI puts up a strong challenge, it's still a little bit off at times. Here it is building a new lab when it could just easily build an energy core next to the unclaimed lab to claim it. 
In my mind, the frustration reaches its peak with a mission called Zeros. You are given instructions to destroy the enemy frame, yet attacking any structure triggers a bomb. This bomb will go off in 10 minutes. It's very easy to accidentally trigger this bomb given that the enemy base is only a short distance away, and they quickly create howitzers to shell you. After the timer starts, you can move a unit onto the bomb to stop it, completing the objective to stop the bomb. However, this does not stop the timer. Fortunately, this does stop the bomb even if the timer hits zero, but it's weird that the timer isn't removed when you disarm the bomb. Capturing the enemy frame will also lead to a game over, as it must be destroyed, not captured. It's also possible to accidentally leave the level early and lose if you move your frame even slightly towards the exit portal once you capture it. Not good design at all, it's an annoying mess. Amusingly, you can even softlock the game if you accidentally capture the enemy frame on the way out of the mission with your frame. How's that for a frame-perfect trick? Fortunately, trusty land sharks make short work of the enemy base, perimeter or no, and I was able to get through it with relatively few restarts. All of this screams to me that the game was not exhaustively playtested, not at all. And you'll notice this lack of polish the longer you play it. Like, even the population cap feels restrictively low, only allowing you to field a large number of units in one squad, without excessive micromanagement. Perhaps the most frustrating thing is that you can see glimpses of what could have been. The game is based on a series of dynamite ideas here, but it just didn't get the polish it needed, and it really shows. Generally speaking, the missions have you guiding your frame to the next or previous world in the chain, surviving encounters with other frames of other factions, or the Scourge. On rare occasions, we even get to destroy or capture other frames. The maps are pretty nice looking, and it is satisfying to watch more and more of them be flattened and collected. I'd be lying if I said it didn't overstay its welcome somewhat towards the end, particularly in how much of the game is spent in trying to break down the enemy frame's perimeter span. Again though, what I find most intriguing about the campaign is the narrative, which you experience from many different perspectives over the course of hundreds of years. I enjoy it not because there are any terribly memorable characters, other than the Emperor, nor how most of the dialogue is delivered by the strange, stretched face advisor terminal people, but there's just this vibe to it. This delightfully mysterious and dystopian vibe. Difficult vibe to nail down precisely, but it has to be this vibe that has me thinking about this game a whole 16 years later. Now, spoiler warning, I'm gonna talk about the ending here real quick, because the ending does go somewhere interesting, even as it is just a cutscene largely unconnected from the other events in the game. The ending of the campaign is something else. The Exodus frame cluster defeats the Emperor's frame and exits through the final portal in the Chain of Worlds. Real quick here, another note on polish or otherwise lack of organization. The wrong Empire frame is used in the final cutscene here. This frame is Exister, which was destroyed in the middle of the campaign. It should be Ruder, the Empire's original frame. Still a pretty sick cutscene though, all things considered. While this is going on, the Harkback frame Zodiac reaches the beginning of the Chain of Worlds, and exits, expecting to find Earth. Lo and behold, however, both Cluster and Zodiac exit to the same world, a prehistoric Earth-like planet. Presumably, this is not Earth in the past, but some far-off world thousands of light years away. The fact that both ends of the chain wind up at the same place is an interesting narrative twist, even if it doesn't quite square with the lore of how humans entered the psychosphere to begin with. This can probably be chalked up to the spirits toying with humanity somehow. Perhaps they always had the ability to exit the psychosphere at this location. Kind of weird that the end cutscene highly implies the Harkback frame Zodiac as being evil and nefarious when ultimately they were correct about the spirits. And well, that's the end. Well, the end that matters to me, anyway. You see, as I mentioned earlier, there is an expansion pack taking place in line with the original campaign, which does give some more background to the world. I never beat it when it first came out, though, because it was just too damn hard. Which, you would think they would crank down the difficulty after the first game was so hard, but nope. And now, after slogging through the main campaign, I can't quite bring myself to continue on the expansion. Maybe someday in the future. It does look like there may be some interesting things there. Brain of the prototype N1770 is plugged into the vice frame control system. Feedback lines are prepared. 
psychoactivity level is normal. The prototype's mind has been successfully integrated into the vice frame control system. Some of the music tracks are pretty out there too, actually. As I mentioned earlier, there is actually a sequel. I'm outright not gonna play it though because it looks bad. And not the fun kind of bad either. This guy did an LP of it though, and that's as close to it as I want to get. So unfortunately, that's the official legacy of Perimeter. But I like to think part of the concept lives on at least in the Creeper World games, which while definitely their own thing, do remind me somewhat of Perimeter by virtue of collecting energy from territory and the energy economy gameplay in general. Though in these games, instead of fighting the Scourge and other frames, you fight the Creeper, an infinitely replicating purple wall of death. Creeper World 3, specifically, is excellent, and I'm definitely looking forward to Creeper World 4 right around the corner. In summation, do I recommend Perimeter? I would still definitely say yes, though you'll get the most out of it if you have a lot of real-time strategy game experience, as, again, it's pretty damn hard. It's the price of a fast food combo meal on both GOG and Steam, so not a huge barrier to entry. Now I should state, for the record, the footage that I've been recording has been of a modded version, which allows the game to be played with better textures and has widescreen support. The vanilla game locks the view to a fairly painful, yet retro, 3x4 resolution. So if you do check it out, I do recommend downloading the Russian resolution mod package to play the best version of it. It's probably not a virus. Thanks for watching! If you liked hearing about that slice of gaming apocrypha, let me know in the comments if any of these choices on screen look interesting for the next one.